I believe that every entrepreneur, every business owner needs to think in the following three things. They need to think about price, product, and positioning. If you are in a position right now where you feel like I don't stand out from my competition, I don't, I can't raise my prices, I don't know what makes me unique, it is the combination of those three that will set you free. Crafted Entrepreneurs. I am so excited to be here with you today. Today we have a special guest. He's a seven-time founder, an investor, business coach. He's an advisor to 15 privately held companies, okay, each ranging up to 10 million plus in annual revenue. He's a husband, a father, an avid Formula One fan, and he's also a podcaster. So Tim has raised over $325 million and was the former VP of business development at Gym Launch before focusing on his coaching business as an advisor to startups. So I'm super excited to have Tim Calise on for the show today. Welcome, Tim. Thank you so much. I am thrilled to be here and uh, looking forward to, uh, to the discussion. Thank you for having me. Okay, so you have worked alongside like successful CEOs and you know, you've scaled multiple businesses yourself. Is there a common quality you see in how successful, you know, CEOs run their businesses? So in the early stages what I've seen is a uh, a dedication to seeing the process through. So I think earlier in the maturation process, it's all about grit. I mean, it, it to, to a great extent, you have to kind of get out of the gravitational pull, trying to get that ball rolling, right? That's, it's incredibly difficult. And so I think tenacity and grit really, really pay uh, dividends, you know, at, at the earlier stages. In the future, as, as you start to ramp up and you're starting to make some money, I'm a big believer in buying back your time rather than just hiring to scale hiring to take on the things that are outside of your zone of genius so that you can continue to kind of stay on your lane. And that is one thing that I've seen that inc- that self-awareness that is required uh, is one of those unique qualities that I've seen with, with people that are uh, incredibly successful. I love that. That self-awareness is everything. And, and I think we've all met those people that have zero self-awareness and yeah. <laughs> they probably don't make it very far in business, but That being said, I think self-awareness is something that you can grow. What are some things that people can do right now to grow their self-awareness? I think there's a fallacy that, at least the way that I grew up, I grew up in uh, in that kind of mindset of the person that knows more will win. So it was all about, you know, what you know and how you can demonstrate what you know, kind of being the smartest person, you know, to, to the outside world. Uh, and and what I've now kind of come to realize is, you know, we're, we're I think we're all collectively, you know, who hasn't heard the the phrase, you know, double down on your strengths, right? right? For a long time, I thought that was like I like numbers, I'm good at math, I should just stick to math and stop writing. For example, I think for me now, it's it's doubling down on my characteristics that are authentically me, and I think the more I've done that, the the better off I have fared. So to some extent, it's having that that honesty with yourself like this is what feeds me you know energy wise financially whatever it might be and not pretending to cover the rest and mm. i think the more honest you can be and and some of that is just you know doing doing the work of you know stepping away from your current environment don't do it behind a screen go for a walk go to wherever you can kind of relax yourself mentally and kind of have that conversation with yourself like if i can only do a handful of things but I can do them really well. What are those? And then start to find others kind of in your circles and build a circle around you of complementary characteristics and skill sets. It becomes who you know, not what you know. That's so good. I want to talk about that later too, because I'm, I wholeheartedly believe that. So let's go back to how you became, you know, who you are today, because like people think there's an easy button. You know, like entrepreneurs, <laughs> especially in the beginning, I call it wannabe, wannabe preneurs, because it's like they think it shouldn't be this hard. And it is that hard. But take it back to like, did you want to, you know, be a part of startups? Like, was that your goal when you were 10 years old? 
So when I was 10, to the, to the great embarrassment uh, of my two sisters, uh, I was the kid who brought, the, brought a briefcase to school Aww. because I was emulating those, you know, kind of what I saw around me uh, and the environment that I grew up in. My dad was in, was in the financial services industry. And I remember from a very early age that I felt that there was the way it should be or the path you're supposed to walk. And quite honestly, it just never, it felt like, you know, wearing a, 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 a jacket that didn't fit. It was like, I know that's what I'm being told, but it just never, I was not the gladiator, you know, go conquer the mountain. I, I skewed much more towards kind of the creative as it related to like having an idea and wanting to do something for myself and things like that. And so it started there. And then I uh, started down the path of working at a a brokerage firm uh, that I very quickly within six months knew was not going to be my future. And I very luckily had a mentor and a boss at that time who saw in me kind of what I was looking for. He, he said, mm. you know, you, you don't belong here. You know, so mm. I said, how do I get to where I want to be? And he made an introduction and that fundamentally changed the trajectory of my life. And I started a hedge fund, raised $300 million on my, my own merits and, and with a partner. And that was the beginning of, of my belief or the, the realization of my belief that I could basically do anything. I was oh. 23, 24 at the time, and I just didn't know any better. So, yeah. you know, I, growing up, I was the, I, I was always more comfortable talking to adults than I was, you know, kids my age. And that parlayed itself into raising the money. And then from there, we actually gave it all back, uh, which we can talk about. We, I, I gave every cent of my $325 million uh, that I crisscrossed the, the country raising. And then I uh, moved into technology and, and I've, I, I personally love the creative aspect uh, of taking an idea to market. It is incredibly difficult, but it is my craft. Uh, oh. and, and I now sit in a seat to be able to help those that are coming behind me, you know, hopefully shorten the learning curve uh, and condense time so they can reach their goals themselves. I love that. So you've been known to say, stop writing business plans. Yes. So how do you, <laughs> yeah, how do you balance having that clear vision, right? Being the visionary and like also needing to, cause I always say like, know the plan and work the plan. And so I, I'm like super interested to see why you say stop writing business plans. I need to learn from you. you no, no. But it's, I, I, it, what I'm speaking to is I think there is a fallacy and you can see this if you're the type of person who sits behind a computer tinkering with you know, an Excel document, like if I can just make it perfect, the business will work. Yeah. And I think we, we, we focus so much on the creative part in, in a silo or in a vacuum of like, I'm now going to write out how the next three years is going to go. And if I get it just perfect and then I hit go, that's how the life is going to work. And it just doesn't, just doesn't work that way. And so the other side of that is a lot of people perceive a business plan to be the method that they use to raise money. Mm. And I see a lot of business owners raising money far too early. So I'm speaking to the idea of like, when you talk to somebody and say, well, how do you start a business? Most people will say, write a business plan and go to a bank and get money or write a business plan and go to investors and raise capital. Like there's lots of other ways you can do it. And the inherent flexibility of reality versus the plan is something you need to be prepared for. Ooh. Okay. I love that. So you're not saying don't have a plan. You're saying like, don't, don't stick to the plan so much that you're not able to pivot. The point of getting into business is not to write business plans. Yes. The point of getting into business is to create a business, but it happens in a much more fluid process than, than you can write out in 20 pages in Excel or, you know, Word. So something that I ran across with working with so many people in the personal brand space, and then they have this idea, you know, to start a, their own business, to start a physical product or a digital based product, they mm -hmm. struggle with going, okay, if I eventually want to sell this one day, I can't be, you know, the personal brand behind it. But mm -hmm. I think about like, you know, Jacqueline Johnson and create and cultivate. So if somebody is the face of their business, and it's based on a personal brand right now, what advice would you give to someone that eventually wants to exit this? They would like to sell it at some point. Yeah, so I think sometimes we're putting the cart before the horse. <laughs> so like, that's like saying, I'm ready to, I have no revenue, but I really am, I'm, I'm making sure I'm optimized for scale. It's like, 
through sales first, and then you can solve the next problem, right? So the, I think the idea is if you, and I think in, in today's environment, branding matters, right? Probably more than ever, at least in, in the last you know, few decades. And because of that, people want to do business with people, not just nameless brands. So if you are the brand, I don't look at that necessarily as a liability. What happens is, are, is do you become the business is a different question than being the brand. So if you are the COO, CFO, and head salesperson, and if you don't want to go with the business when you sell it, then you're the bottleneck and you're going to have to be replaced and that's going to cost money and risk and all of those things will be reflected in the price that a buyer will pay. So I think step one is get a business that you are, that is performing and, and meeting the expectations and the mi milestones that you've set out. And then the next problem you solve might be, how do I extract myself from being either the bottleneck or the face? You know, there's lots of ways. I, I had the great fortune to work alongside Alex Hermosi over at Gym Launch. Alex was Gym Launch for a great you know, many, many years. He was the founder and, and face of it. But that business was sold to a private equity firm almost a year and a half ago. And he's now doing his own thing. And that was a year-long process of how do, how do you remove the key kind of cornerstone of a business? Is it possible? Absolutely. It just takes intention. Mm. That was one of my questions I was going to ask you. Is it the systems or the CEO that make a business successful? In the beginning, growing businesses and nascent businesses rely on sales. It's what they use for fuel. So in the beginning, I would say the leadership of the CEO matters quite a lot. Mm. At some point, you get to a, a, a point where, in my opinion, the CEO sets the, the tone and sets the culture and sets the direction. But typically, it's very hard to find a detail operations focused CEO at that level. They typically want to be looking forward, uh, not down or backward. Uh, mm. And finding someone who typically has con uh, complementary skill sets uh, usually puts the business on, on a strong footing at that point. So, so many people want to be entrepreneurs. I, I think social media has like made it, you know, where it's like, oh, of course I want to be my own boss and I want to have financial freedom. I want to have time freedom, you know? And so do you believe that everybody can be an entrepreneur or do you believe that like some people, like it's either you've got it or you don't like some people are just meant to be employees. I think, I think there is something that is innate in the entrepreneurial journey, which is a sorting process. So can anybody start? Yes. But I think it's an infinite game, right? You don't get into business to necessarily say, I'm going to do this for a year and then I'm going to go do it. Like it is, you're signing up for, you know, an un, undefined end, you know, period of time. And if you're not willing to play an, a, a game with no endpoint, and you don't have the stamina and grit to see that through, then it probably isn't for you. I think you're absolutely right. The The idea that entrepreneurship today is, you know, start a business, get a Lamborghini, live in the 50,000 square foot house and fly private is not reality. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's, it's obviously a whole lot harder than that. And I think so, it, it depends on the person. I mean, I know for me, I've struggled with, I'm a dad, I have three kids. You know, it has, I've burned the candle at both ends at times. Uh, and the idea, I don't believe in work-life balance. I think that's kind of a fallacy in and of itself because we live integrated lives 24 seven and you have to make choices with how you dedicate and, and invest your time and, and spend your time. So if you're the type of person who doesn't want to put the, put in the reps and doesn't want to do it forever, then you probably shouldn't start. <laughs> I love that advice. So, you know, I, one of the things that got me so into like, the investing world about seven and eight, seven or eight years ago was, you know, my kids were getting a little bit older. They were not in the baby phase anymore. And I realized like they need me more as they get older, which is crazy. Like when they're babies, you know, this, if you have three kids, like when they're babies, you think, Oh my gosh, like, am I ever going to get my time back? But then they need you more like emotionally as they get older. Yes. And so I said, I'm going to become like a full-time investor. Right. And I believe that now in this like phase of my life, I feel like it's like full time and I'm constantly like looking at deals and like just it's it takes so much time. <laughs> and I kind of think like there is this fallacy of time freedom too when you are a true entrepreneur because you're never, 
you know, I don't know, satisfied. Like you always want to do like the next deal. It's kind of like, you know, what's that next thing for me? Have you found yourself in that place? Right. I'm assuming you have, because you're still giving back. You're on this podcast right now. Right. And how do you find that balance? Right. Of like knowing like, okay, like I, I think that all of these things are awesome, but I need to focus my energy on this one thing right now. So I have personally taken the approach of, I think it was Warren Buffett who said, you know, uh, compounding is the eighth wonder of the world. Mm -hmm. And those that recognize it benefit and those that don't do it at their own peril. I have tried in the last six to 12 months to create greater alignment amongst the things that I'm doing. Because a year and a half ago, it felt like I had a bunch of disparate things. Like I had a project over here and a client here and an investment here. And do I want to do a deal over here? And it, there was no kind of cohesive glue between, between all of those. So I had to get really honest with myself and more diligent about how and what I looked at to make sure it was the right thing that, and each thing kind of compounds on, on each other. So uh, that's how I've chosen to look at it. And it's paid, it's done, done well uh, thus far. I mean, the, the business that I have right now, I, I have client partners that I work with. I'm an equity investor in, in most of them. And I like the idea of the aligned interests uh, that if I can help them build something that will both give me a return kind of along the way using an investing analogy, that's cash flow, but also, you know, a, uh, a hopefully a seat at the table uh, if, if an exit comes. So that's how I've tried to align rather than an investing world over here and a, and a client operating world here. I've, I've chosen to try to integrate those as much as possible. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I love that. Ad- I love that advice. So it's kind of like, you know, when you feel like you have too many hats that you're wearing, it's like, what's the main theme that like you're really good at and then just build on that. And I think like I've done that with real estate. So mm-hmm. like, we have a lot of umbrellas under the real estate investing business. And, but there's a common, you know, it's just like, they all go, they all feed into each other. They all, they all like make each other more profitable. Yeah. I was listening to Ryan Pineda a couple of days ago and yeah, I think he's taken this approach as well. Right. So, you know, it wasn't just, well, do I do a flip over here and I own a title company over here and I do content over here. It's like he's built an ecosystem now where if somebody comes into his world, there's multiple ways. And, and the way I talk about this is the idea of, of multiple wallets. Okay. So a client can come into his world and one wallet might be the title wallet. One might be the coaching wallet. One might be the investor wallet. One, they're, they're independent of each other and spending money in one area does not take away from the others. So I spent 10 years in, in the fitness industry. Uh, and so you know, in a gym, gyms are, are designed, traditional gyms are designed around the idea of movement. So you come in, you get access to equipment and things like that. But then nutrition, as an example, or accountability coaching are three legs of a fitness business done right, in my opinion. Each of those are separate. You wouldn't say, I'm not going to sign up for a gym because I have to buy, you know, or I'm not going to get nutrition counseling because I want accountability over here, or I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to not shop because I need to buy clothes, like, Mm -hmm. or go for food. You know, they're different, they're different allocations, different budgets in your mind. And I think done right, you can build a business that that taps into different kind of buying decisions, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Love that. Love that advice. So now that we're on the topic mm. of investing, when you're constantly being sent an overwhelming amount of pitch decks and opportunities, mm-hmm. of, you know, like what to invest in, do you have like a criteria that helps you choose like right away? So you don't even like waste your time going through the deck. Like there's these three things it has to have, you know, and you're going to invest in it or you pass. Do you have something yeah. like that? Absolutely. So a couple of the screens for me are if I don't have expertise in the industry. So my first screen is I generally work with service-based businesses that have either have recurring revenue or we can install recur- a recurring revenue component. So a membership, a subscription, things like that. So that's basically be, you know, services and technology kind of SaaS are my, are my areas of expertise. I don't know the first thing about manufacturing. I, you know, that's outside of my, my, my purview. So I try to stay in my lane, you know, so industry wise, that's, that's the first. The second is, do I have expertise in the area that they need kind of, uh, that they're looking for support in? So I, my focus has been primarily on pricing, product and positioning. If you need, you know, 
to run a better funnel. There are people that have designed funnels more than I have. So that's, I can't be additive in that way. The third is where can I bring my network to bear? So I have my Rolodex, that is a, an, element, an element of capital as far as I'm concerned. I'm, I can bring tradition, I can bring money, but I can also bring connections and, and people in my network. So if each of those three are not checked, then it's typically not something I look at. And those are fairly, fairly quickly, I can get through those in about 10 minutes to understand whether it's, uh, you know, if it's the right fit or not. Now, if you were to start over in your investing journey, like completely fresh today with, but you have all of the knowledge you have, yeah. what would you personally invest in first? So I will say I started making money above what I needed to live in my early 20s. And I, at the time, absolutely fell prey to the idea of, of buying stuff for the sake of buying stuff, uh, <laughs> doing it for, for what it said about me rather than, than what I should have done. Uh, and so I'm, and I've been open about that. So I, I would, if I was to go back, I would have thought much more consciously about what I needed at each step in my life. So early mm -hmm. on, I would have invested in mentors and coaching and probably a therapist earlier in my life to like get my head right and get mm -hmm. my belief systems and my traits aligned. And once I poured, I couldn't pour any more money there, that would also increase my income, I, I would believe. Then the next thing is I would try to sock away as much money as possible in cash flowing businesses and assets, real estate being one of them, uh, so that I could, and I would just keep filling that bucket up until the point where, you know, I, I would have sufficient cash flow from those assets that I can kind of pick and choose what I want to do thereafter. I got to a similar place ultimately, but it was a whole lot more stressful. And the roller coaster, the ups and downs were significantly greater than they probably should have been or otherwise would have been. So I love this. And I want to recap this for all the listeners, because what you're saying is you would have invested in yourself first, right? Absolutely. Making sure that like everything's right inside. And then you would have gone into the cash flowing assets. And I think people, you know, because of just the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? It's like, we want to make mm -hmm. sure our environment is good. And our first environment is within right? If like this environment isn't right, we're not going to be as effective as we can be in business. So I am obsessed with the fact that you said get a therapist. Yes. So let's talk about the stock market because I never talk about that on my podcast. I, I really don't know a lot about the stock market. So I would love to hear some of your expertise for all of our listeners that may be interested in, you know, getting involved in the stock market. So my, I've been trading in the market for 20 years or so. Yeah. Uh, the world has also significantly changed in the last, uh, certainly in the last 10 years, five to 10 years. The highest performing investment company, hedge fund or you know, version, stock trading company in the history of the, of the United States has no finance people making decisions. Mm. They are all mathematicians. It's a company wow. called Renaissance Technologies. It's run by a guy named Jim Simons. He started in the early 80s, and he has basically beaten the pants off of any other investor, including Warren Buffett on a return basis over the last 40 years. He hires mathematicians, theoretical physicists, and PhDs in math to write models on how to make money in every single market climate. And I bring that up simply because I think as we stand today, the idea of trading the market, if that is kind of your perspective of what you want to do, has become increasingly more difficult given the advent of big data and now AI and things like that, mm -hmm. which if, if you're in that world, I think there's only two ways to do it. And one of them is to be a short-term trader, like minute, you know, seconds, minutes, hours, or to be a long-term investor for value like a Warren Buffett. And I think for 99.9% .9 of people, they would be best served by taking the like just every day or every week or every month, put a little bit in the market over the course of time, just like real estate, and just let it sit and build upon itself and compound, compound. If you have missed the last 10, the top 10 trading days in the last 10 years, most people know the average returns of like the S&P is like eight or 9% a year. If you missed the 10 trading days because you think you can time the market, your 9% number becomes half of 1%. If you miss the top 20 trading days because you're trying to time the market, you have a negative rate of return. Mm. 
So for anyone who's looking at the stock market, think about things that you use and stuff that you think will be around for 10 years or 20 years from now, and just put money in those. Uh, and happy to connect with anybody who wants more information than that, but buy you know, ETFs and, and just let the money work for you over the course of time and, and don't try to be smarter than, uh, than the market. Mm-hmm. Okay, so reach out to Tim if you have any questions about that. Yeah. And it, it, that's a very much a long-term play on your money. Like anytime you're putting money into the stock market, it's like you have to be good with not seeing that in 20 to 30 years, like for 20 to 30 years. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I think the the longer, you know, I, I have no idea what the market's going to do today or tomorrow, right? But I can tell you in 50 years from now, it's going to be higher. Mm-hmm. And the people that are getting the highest rates of return are ones who are in the market consistently. And if you want to go kind of one level down from that, think about how it kind of what, what's going on in the market in in the terms of like units of risk. So like right now, does it feel like you want to go all in or should you be a little more conservative? Probably right now, you should be a little more conservative because we're in a could go up from here, could go sideways or, or could go down. During COVID, when everyone was panicking, would have been a great time to say, you know what, if I don't need the money for the next 10 years, chances are now is probably a decent time where most people were thinking what's going to happen the next day or two or a week or a month. And that's mm-hmm. where you kind of missed out on those opportunities. So it's that old adage, when people are greedy, be fearful. And when people are fearful, be greedy. Oh, I love that. I love that. When people are fearful, be greedy. Buy up more. Now right. let's talk about the comparison. Cause you said also real estate and that's what I'm super into. So yeah. do you believe that people need to have both? Like, do you need to have real estate cash flowing assets and stock market or is somebody fine with just going, Hey, like, you know, my, cause my goal for myself is I want 20,000 units and that's mm-hmm. when I've made it, you know? And so I'm, everything I do is like based on getting to 20,000 units and that's where all the money flows into really. So I would love to hear your perspective on like, is that good or should I be doing stock market stuff too? So let me ask you a question. If I gave you kind of a a hundred percent allocation of what you know, how much do you know about the stock market versus how much do you know about real estate? I I know. I I feel like an absolute idiot when it comes to the stock market. That's why I've never gotten into it. And it doesn't light me up either. I'm not like, I don't even have a desire to learn it. So I'm like, let's just go on all in on real estate. So there's your answer. Over the course of time, you should be investing in, like for me, I don't know if you said, here's a hundred units, I could do that deal, but I, I probably wouldn't know how to operate a deal like that. I would need a partner. I know how to manage a stock portfolio because I've been doing it for so long. So I personally like to allocate my resources in the areas that I know about. Now you could say, well, doesn't that keep you fixed? And it's like, mm-hmm. well, if I wanted to invest in real estate, me personally, I don't think I know enough about real estate to, to, to know a good deal from a bad one necessarily. So I'd want to, I would need to educate myself in a way to start doing deals in real estate at scale. Like 20,000 units for you, for you is the equivalent of like, I would go all in on, on US equity or you know, stocks because it's just what I know. And I encourage people to, to allocate their resources in places that they feel confident in because it's lower risk if you know how the game is played. And if you want to get into something that you're not comfortable with, make it a lower part of your, a smaller part of your portfolio and typically try to find someone you trust to give you to kind of be your guide, at least in the beginning. Oh my goodness. Okay. So yeah, I feel better. I was like, gosh, should I get into the stock market? And you know, it's kind of what I tell people too, because like 10 years ago when I started to make a lot of money and I hired financial advisors and I lost a lot of it because they didn't treat my money like I would treat my money. They didn't take care of it. Like, mm-hmm. you know, and I just hired somebody from church, you know? So, you know, you have to invest in things that you understand is what I'm hearing from you. That's my philosophy too. Yeah. And also if you're going to partner with somebody, if you're going to go and, you know, hire a financial advisor or hire somebody that's, you know, can manage your portfolio for you, what's the due diligence look like when you're trying to like, that out? Is this person going to actually manage my money well in the stock market? So a a few things. So the idea, everybody's thinking about diversification. And I think diversification has turned into from a value add, like you shouldn't put all of your eggs in one basket 
it's turned into like just throw things around, you know, and hopefully by having things in different buckets, that somehow reduces your risk. That would be like me saying, I have a zero allocation to crypto. So I'm going to go buy a bunch of Dogecoin. That probably makes no sense for me because it doesn't meet my investing criteria. It doesn't meet my profile. And I have no way to properly understand whether it was a good idea or a bad idea. So I stay away from things that I don't know. You hire people in areas where you need guidance. The challenge with financial advisors in general is you need to find one who is not pushing their agenda on you. There's a difference between financial planning and a financial advisor. So financial planning is like, okay, Kayla, this is where you want to be 30 years from now. Let's reverse engineer a path to get there. That's one version. If you uh, hire a financial advisor who only makes money when you trade stocks, you're going to be very fast to realize that they want you to buy stocks. So you have to be understand how they get paid, how they make money, and ask them questions around like that. It shouldn't be a, a it should be prescriptive to you and not uh, and not just simply you know you're stepping into their world and uh, and they tell you what to do. So they have to want to educate you as well on on the stock market. Yeah. Do you think it should also be a requirement to like see their bank accounts, like to see how much money they have? <laughs> I have a lot of financial advisor friends. I personally believe that most people should just do it on their own, stick to a program, like every paycheck, if that's how you get paid, or every month when you get a distribution, take a portion and go and put it in like the S&P 500 or you know the NASDAQ and just stick with those two and do it like clockwork. Because most financial advisors track record of picking stocks is no better than that. And that's actually been proven. So I think you have to be really clear about what it is you're trying to get. Most financial advisors can't get you, the, the highest paid folks in the world right now, and they're typically making a billion dollars a year or more, are, are professional investors. That's not who's managing your money. You know, mm -hmm. they're mm -hmm. managing endowments of colleges. The person in a, in a local office, typically speaking, uh, I think you can replicate a very similar thing on your own, as long as you are the type of person who can stick with a program and not change it. Okay. And I think that's the hardest part of the whole thing is like, put it on, put it on repeat. Having that discipline. Yep. What were exactly. some things you did to build up discipline? I had to uncover why I was doing what I was doing. And mm -hmm. I think I, for a long time, was trying to find the shortcut. I think because I had some success early on, it was like, the world is just to, you know, to be arbitraged. It's like, there's, there's risk-free, you know, uh, benefit out there. I just have to like figure out how to do it. And once I got out of that mindset, it was like, stop trying to do it today. Like do it right, not do it fast. And for me, as I started to kind of dig into like, why did I need it fast? Like that was like, because I wanted to buy a new car. Like, okay, why? <laughs> well, because it's really fun. Like, and it ends up being, it's like, this is ridiculous. Like, let's just get back to the things that I know to be true. That was one. The second is I became a better organizer of what I wanted to do. Instead of deciding in the moment what I wanted to do, it was like every day I think about what I'm going to do tomorrow. Because the heck of a lot easier to commit to myself than I'm going to, a lot of people struggle working out. Like, Schedule your gym time tomorrow, today, because mm -hmm. when you're in the moment, you're probably, you may not feel like you want to do it. And then realizing that like, that's a commitment to yourself. And the more times you break it, uh, it, it undermines your own confidence in yourself. And so it's all, in my opinion, it's all mental. It absolutely is. But there are those things that you can do, right? Like I do the same thing. I have it scheduled out with a trainer five days a week. So that way I actually show up because if I pay for it, I will not miss it because <laughs> I don't like to lose money. And I do those safeguards because I'll always find something better to do like with my time. Absolutely. Let's talk about raising capital. I find it fascinating that you raised $325 million and then you had to give it back. Tell me about that story. Yes. So I was 21, almost 22 when I joined, I joined a guy in Birmingham, Alabama of all places. So I'm from New York. I went to school in Washington, DC and I moved to Alabama to, to start a financial services firm. And we had about a million dollars under management, which was like friends and family and things like that. And I started the process, I think it was just turned 22, and had to figure out a way to differentiate ourselves in the marketplace. 
And at that time, just to kind of set the scene, this was like 2002, the hedge fund industry was red hot. It was like the Wild West. And it was one of the hottest kind of themes at the time was don't put your money with a, you know, a Charles Schwab or whatever those, you know, a, a traditional firm. It was find a hedge fund manager because they were like the brightest of the bright and made all this money doing, you know, in an unregulated way. And so we we played off of that to some extent, but the tone of the time was managers had a big head about them. And it, it, the, the feeling as, a, as someone who's like, if I was giving my money to you, the feeling was almost like I should be thanking you for taking my money. Mm. And I felt like that was wrong at the time. And being a small fund, growth doesn't happen literally. It's like you start slow and then you get that pair of, you know, that kind of hockey stick. So in the beginning, I was like, well, where can we get money based on this, this kind of differentiation on, you know, authenticity and we cared about you and things like that, which was, was genuine. And so I started getting people's retirement accounts. It was like IRAs and things like that. And we got a hundred thousand or 250,000 or $500,000 at a time. And that took us from a million to about $25 million. And from 25 to 50 took us, if it took us a year and a half to go from basically a million to 25 million. It took us like three months to get to 50. It took me another three months to get to 100. And it took me six months to get to 200 because the, the ball starts rolling and the types of investors you can talk to changes and things like that. I, I was actually on a call uh, about an hour and a half ago with some folks who are raising a few million dollars and they're going to do a friends and family and kind of local community round. And that's a different feeling than you know someone who's going to give you 100 million bucks. So mm -hmm. uh, it, was a, it was a great time. It was one of the most successful things I've ever done. But the end of that capital raising kind of window was the end the, the fall of 2007. And everyone who was in the market in 2008 knows that the fall of 2008 was when the stock market crashed. We saw the beginnings of that in 2007. And after I literally was working, you know, seven days a week, hundred hundreds hours, uh, you know, hundred plus hours a week, crisscrossing the country, going to conferences and meeting investors and things like that. We just said, you know, guys, the market is exhibiting characteristics that are not consistent with the way that a normal market works. So something is going on. I just don't know what it is and I don't know when it's going to rectify itself. So in October of 2007, I called all of our investors together and I said, guys, you're paying us to manage your money. We're going to cash. We're selling every investment we have. And I will waive our fees as long as you leave your money with us. And we will re-enter the market when we think that the, the odds are, are, again, in our favor. To, uh, I said, or option two is you can take your money. And just about everyone said, you guys have lost your touch. Everyone's telling me that everything will be fine. And we want our money back. So yeah, we, we basically gave back uh, 345, 348 million dollars at the end of 2007, uh, and we walked away because uh, it was wow. the right thing to do. And although we were early, uh, we proved right. Uh, and that was just it, it. It was a lesson for me in, you know, they say like uh, ethics and morals, and you know, are only tested when no one's watching. To some extent, it was like the easy thing to to do would have been, you know, in in, in that business, you get you get paid one to two percent of the money you manage like we were making three to six million dollars just to show up for work it would have been easier to just say let's just keep going but we made the choice to to do what we felt was the right thing to do the the, the right thing for our investors to do and and again although we were proven right it was probably the most painful uh, thing i've ever done uh, professionally even to today all of that work to feel like it's going away but yeah. Did it come back years later with all of those investors now trusting you even more? Yeah, I, I believe it's, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in kind of like it, it, it served me just fine. Uh, and I have to believe that, you know, the place that I've ended up now is, uh, like I said, it, it's a whole lot rockier than I probably otherwise uh, would have designed it. But I think ultimately it came back in spades. Wow. That's an amazing story. And that's awesome that you did that. I just started my, I closed my first fund last year and I'm raising for my second fund right now. And so I can only imagine, <laughs> um, I'm raising, my, you know, 10 million right now in the next 90 days. So 300 and, you know, 48 million. I'm like, oh, that would, that would sting, but you always do have to do the right thing, you know? So. Yeah. And, and you have to know what business you're in to some extent, like, like the thing that the thing for us, the reason why we were so successful 
is we were not the top performing fund in our in in on the in the marketplace. We were the most consistent. So what we sold was you'll always have access to me. Here's my cell phone number. You never have to worry your money's at risk. We're not stealing it. It's always safe. That was the first. And the second was you will never open up an email from us that says that we lost 20% of your money. And in four years, I believe we only had one down month. Wow. So for someone who's looking, I mean, think about if you're retired, you've worked really hard to you know earn this money, this, this nest egg. We returned on average about one and a half percent per month like clockwork. So I was able to raise money from institutions who wanted consistency and high net worth individuals who wanted certainty. It was like, you'll never get an up 50% year, but you'll never get a down 50% year. We should make 10 to 20% like clockwork each and every year. And that was a story that people could really get behind. And so that taught me, and this, you know, for your fund specifically, it's like, you have to know what you're, what, what is the story and what is the consistency? You know, what is, what is it you're selling? Cause not every investment is the same clearly. And you have to know kind of what your niche is and, and how that matches with the investor profile you're looking for. Mm-hmm. Wow. Thank you for that. Now on that note, if you had to go out and raise a hundred million today, what are the top three things you would do? So assuming an operating company, well, if it was to do what I was doing before, it would be probably maybe much harder now because the big guys keep getting bigger in this regulatory environment. But if it was, I want to raise something for uh, a real estate fund would be a great example because I think that's, I've got a lot of folks uh, in my network who, who are in real estate. For me, I would try to think about where could we be value add and what is the under part, underserved part of the market? I think, you know, you've got Grant Cardone and those guys who are like, buying up you know a certain type uh, and hedge funds are now getting involved in multifamily as an example i would be looking for what is going to be around for the next you know 20 years i personally like the idea of you know doing conversions of existing uh, commercial space or professional space that is now empty i know some friends of mine who are buying up large you know large buildings and converting them uh, i think that's super interesting i think the rental market is going to remain strong uh, and so providing opportunities for people to community around rentals is really interesting to me right now. And so my my personal opinion would be I'd raise $100 million on a lifestyle concept of, you know, taking underutilized assets and building something for, you know, the the retiree generation and probably one, you know, the folks coming behind them uh, around the idea of kind of community and and. And things like that. So that's probably what I would do right now. I don't think I could compete as a as a hedge fund manager from zero to a hundred million without a very clear pedigree. Uh, it's much harder today than it than it was twenty years ago. Wow. So having that that story that you're sharing and that you're selling every single day, that's what you would get extremely yeah. clear on. And then what would you do to find the network? Right. There was something you did yeah. to like go and find all of those people. How do people find those high net worth individuals? Yeah, so 100 million was the was the key to to your question. Uh, that's a lot of money. Like I <laughs> I, were, I live in the world of operating businesses where you know we might raise you know a few million dollars is enough to to bring a, a product to market. So I keep a network of folks you know that obviously that I've that I've met with. I think mentorship groups and mastermind groups right now are the key to everything. I have had more connections through finding like-minded people. And so, you know, the idea of investing in yourself, I would invest in, in groups, get in the room with people who can, you know, no faster way to grow your network than to help get access to other people's networks. And so I'm, I'm a big believer in that. So find the rooms you need to be in, talk to folks in there, do a joint venture, offer to help, and just try to figure out ways to do kind of leveraged expansion of your network and tap into others. Yeah. The deal I'm raising for right now is actually somebody I met in a mastermind. It's her. She's the main sponsor on the deal. And yeah. like, I'm always, I was just at a mastermind last week. I'm going to one next week because you're, you're always meeting somebody in the room that you're either going to do a deal with, or you're going to learn from, and it's going to expand your thinking and you know, the way that you do business. So I love that you're like a huge advocate for investing in yourself. So how do you attract the attention of potential investors when you're in a room like that? Like, what do you do to stand out? You know, if you're in a room of a hundred people at this mastermind, what are you doing, Tim, to like, be like, I am the person. (laughs) 
I, so we, we talked about branding earlier. Yep. I think everyone should have the equivalent of their, you know, slogan as a personal brand. So for me, you know, whether it be, I, I try to get a speaking opportunity if I can. And if not, I go and meet as many people as possible. And I'm like, I'm the guy that raised $350 million at 23. Mm. You got to find you just like if you're writing copy, right? If you're in marketing, you got to have a hook. So what's your hook? And you might not have that story, but you have something in you that is engaging that somebody looking at it will be like, I want to know more. And that's all you need. And if it's, if you're doing a deal and something that you don't, if you haven't had experience in that specific thing, have a partner, you got to have some way to build credibility. And then it's like, Hey, I'm Tim, I'm building a SaaS product. I've got the former CTO of fill in the blank as my partner, and we're going to go tackle this thing. And let me tell you about, you know, you just got to get, the, you got to set the hook. Uh, Cause most of the deals that I've ever done, you just start there. And then it's like, Hey, we'd love to grab 15 minutes afterwards. So that's what I would do. What if there are people listening in right now that don't have a partner and they mm -hmm. don't have a hook yet? What would be your advice to them? I think everybody has a unique, I just believe it's like, you know, we're all unique in some way. I think you have a perspective, you have a vision, you have something that you can lead with that is engaging. You know, so figure out what, you know, your, your only statement. I am the only person who, and I think everyone can come up with something. Like for me, I'm like, there are very few former hedge fund managers that have run gyms that have also built technology. Like that's unique. Whether I've done anything with those or not, like that's a unique kind of uh, Venn diagram of, of experience. So yeah. figure out yours. Like I'm the only guy who loves a good dad joke, who's a dad of three and, you know, uh, you know, races uh, motorcycle on the weekend, like whatever it is, you have something that someone's like, that's cool. Just to start somewhere. I agree. I agree. And I think the more that you get to know yourself and your own hooks, you're going to be better at creating relationships with people in general. You talk about raising relationship capital is just as important as raising actual capital. What are some things yeah, that you to nurture relationships? Yeah. So, uh, and just to kind of follow on your, your question, what if I have nothing to start with? Find someone that you think you want to talk to, do a little bit of work to find out what business they're in, what industry, something that might resonate with them and do the work for free and send it to them and say, Hey, I happen to notice that you did a, you know, a talk last week. Uh, and you said the thing you're worried about is writing good hooks. So here are 15 hooks that I wrote based on what I learned about you. Hopefully one of them is beneficial. Wow. I get more reach outs of like, hey, I'd love to work for you. I'd love to work with you. I'd love to do something. Um, let me know when you have 30 minutes or an hour. Those go nowhere. I had someone send me a full teardown of every one of my social channels and my website. He did a Loom video. It was 34 minutes long. He sent it to me over the weekend. And the beginning was, if you can't listen to all of it, here are the three things you need to know. I went and dissected everything, the three things you need to know, the three problems, and here's what I would do to solve them. And if that resonates with you, I'd love to tell you the rest. Wow. He and I were on the phone Monday morning because he did the work. Mm -hmm. He didn't make me do the work. So if you don't have the relationships, you have the time. If you don't, you got to have the interest. You got to have the grit. Like, that's the part you can earn your way into the room. You just got to figure out the angle and everyone can do that. So oh. that's how you build relationship capital. I love that because I can't remember who said this, but if you're not willing to work for free, you'll work till the day you die. And it's, yeah. it's about having that mindset of like knowing, like I might not ever actually see, you know, you might not hire him. You might hire somebody else, but it'll come back to him in some way. If he has that type yeah. of grit, right? Well, it's, it's, I'm on, I'm on, I'm on a podcast with you and I'm already thinking like, if I don't hire him, I, if somebody said, do you know someone who fits this description? He'll be the first person I think of. Yeah. That's amazing. That's amazing. So we're going to wrap this thing up. What is the biggest mistake you see entrepreneurs make that you wish you could like hold them back from making that mistake? I believe that every entrepreneur, every business owner needs to think in the following three things. They need to think about price, product, and positioning. If you are in a position right now where you feel like I don't stand out for my competition, I, don't, I can't raise my prices, I don't know what makes me unique, 
It is the combination of those three that will set you free. I see many business owners failing because they are not paying close attention to, you know, it's it's like the there's a book called The 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing. And one of the parts in there says you are either first to market, you either have to be the first, or you have mm-hmm. to be the best of a new category. So if you can't be the first, which you most likely will not be, you have to create your own category. And I think people need to drive into a the idea of differentiation in that way harder than they ever have before because the marketplace is riddled with information, right? That's and the, the second part of that is stop telling and start showing. So good. If you have the goods, show. Don't say what you can do, show them how you are going to do it. So I have a uh, an inside group, uh, it's completely free of uh, mentees that I have. Uh, and every week uh, I do a behind the scenes note. I'm like behind the scenes of how I did something. So nobody has to guess. I'm not saying I can do this. It's like, I'm actually going to de- uh, deconstruct something I did in the last week. And so that's at timcalise.com slash VIP. You can get access to it. Uh, and that's just a way for, if you want an example of what that looks like, uh, just go there uh, and I'll send, I'll send a couple over to you. Awesome. Okay. Tim com forward slash VIP. Yeah. Yeah. T I M C A L I S E.com slash VIP. And I'm on uh, Instagram as well. Tim dot police. Uh, and anyone who listens to this show, uh, if you send me Kayla C A Y L A, uh, I have a special gift for anyone who uh, listens to this show and reaches out on Instagram. Okay. You guys better reach out. I'm going to send him Kayla in the DMS. I'm gonna be like, please send me the gift. Okay. This was such go. a great conversation. We're going to make sure to link up everything in the show notes, all of Tim's, uh, Instagram links and everything like that. So you guys can keep following him. Thank you so much for being on the show. It was so good. I learned so much. I love having interesting people on where, I mean, I feel like I need to have you on like 10 more times and just ask you more and more questions. Happy to come back anytime. <laughs> and you also have a podcast, so we're going to link that up in the show notes as well. I do. Yes. Thank you so much. Leveling the field with Tim Calise. Uh, look forward to seeing everybody there. Awesome. Thanks, Tim. And thank you everybody for listening in. Make sure to take a screenshot of this and tag Kayla and Tim on Instagram, Facebook, wherever you hang out. Maybe we'll repost it. Ask us any questions in the DMs as well about this episode. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.